Chapter 3. The Dog, Taro Shortly after my arrival in Lord Akiyama's mansion, or rather, the shed that housed one of his cooks, Yone disappeared out of my life. One day she was not there anymore. She was my last wink with my parents in my former life, but I recalled no pains when it snapped. I had made new friends and had no need of her anymore. In everyone's life, there are certain people who have helped to form the, his character and given a direction to his life. They are like big stones in a river that force the water to alter its course. Lord Akiyama's cook was such a stone in the little stream of my early life. He was known as Togen by everyone. He had received that nickname because of the size and shape of his head, which, I must admit, did resemble a melon. He did not seem to be called by that name and answered to it as if it brought him honor rather than ridicule. Perhaps for that reason, most people seem to have forgotten its original meaning and meant no harm at all when they called him by it. I recall once asking him if he did not mind. He looked at me in surprise, and then feeling the shape and size of his head with both hands, said, But, Taro, it is like a melon. Togen did not cook for Lord Akiyama. His house had a more skillful cook whose kitchen was far away from where Togen reigned. He cooked for the servants, the gardeners, the stable boys, all of those in so lowly a position they were more used to millet and barley than to rice. Lord Akiyama had many ret retainers. Some were of such importance that they ate in his mansion, others took their meals in other houses in the grounds. The lowliest of all, among whom I belonged, ate in the kitchen where Togen cook. Even the stable boys had a room of their own. I often brought their food to them there. Each person within the grounds of the mansion knew exactly what his position was, its importance, and the amount of respect he could demand from those beneath him. I was spared having to speculate over this, since everyone was above me, and since if I should ever be in doubt about the degree of respect a person deserved, I quickly learned that humility in very large portions was always consumed with the greatest of pleasure. An exception to this rule was Togen, who disliked seeing anyone demean himself. He treated it all with exactly the same degree of politeness, even to me, though he made me work hard, and he never gave me an order without adding a please and a thank you, dropped as naturally from his lips to me as it was to a samurai. Impoliteness, Taro, he would say, marks you as a fool, for it takes away from you an advantage and gives you none in return. On the other hand, excessive meekness and modesty makes others distrust you and suspect you of being a schemer not worthy of their confidence. There are many jobs in a kitchen that even a small child can perform. Because of Togen, I found few of them irksome. He taught me there was no work not worth doing well. He was full of truly wise sayings, and I did not, if I did not understand them, he did not mind spending the time explaining what he meant. He could read, which very few of Lord Akiyama's servants could, and wrote a very forceful hand. He was a very fervent Buddhist and practiced Zen, but he never went to the temple. He used to visit a priest who lodged near the temple. Sometimes he would sit for hours facing the wall, staring at, his, staring at it as if he were trying his best not to look right through it. But then suddenly he would stop and take out his bamboo flute and play. I liked to listen to him, especially on summer evenings when we would sprawl under a great pine tree growing near our shed until late at the night. Togen said that the tree was holy and a god lived in it. Declaring that he had seen it himself, he claimed the god was about my size and had hair as green as the needles on the tree. He would tell such tales while looking at me and so seriously that I did not for a moment doubt that it was saying that what he was saying. I used to search for the little god of the pine tree, thinking he was just the right size for me to play with. Once Togen gave me his flute to play, but I could not make no sound I could not make sound come out of it, even though I blew as hard as I could. He laughed and promised when I had grown a little he would teach me to play and make, flu make a flute of my own. Togen's flutes were highly valued, though he never charged more than a few coppers for them. He would take great care in making them, selecting bamboo of the right thickness and quality, and could easily spend a whole afternoon. He loved making the flutes, and the payment he asked for was meant to spare the purchaser the embarrassment of receiving a gift. But he would not make a flute for everyone. For those who refused, he had such a long list of excuses that he tired them out before he offended them. Those years I spent with Togen were probably the happiest of my life. He took better care of me than most parents would, and I grew straight and strong like a well-tended young tree. The soldier who had brought me to Kavuchu had been right when he claimed the kitchen was a good place to work, for I was always well-fed, and in the, winter in the winter months, when the plain of Kai can be bitterly cold and the mountains that surrounded are covered in snow, I was warm. What Togen wanted to teach me more than anything else was contentment. As we sat under the tree in summer, he would point to a bird and say, Look, Taro, that bird is satisfied being what it is, a bird. It knows what it can do and what it can't. It is content just as the tree is satisfied with being a tree. The little cloud up there, here he would point to a small cloud sailing in the sky, knows it is not big enough to hold thunder or rain in it, but is not unhappy because of that. 
I always agreed with him. I knew he meant me well, and sometimes I was convinced it was wrong of me to be, wish to be more than I was. But I could not be as content as Togan wished me to be. When I sought the sons of the Lord of the Samurai, I had only one desire, to be among them and be recognized as their equal. That year, Lord Takeda's son Shiro came of age and a great celebration was held in his honor. Shiro was the Wakotano I had seen on my first day in Kafuchu, who had worn the fur-lined boots. Now as he came of age, his name was changed to Takeda Suwa Katsuyori. It was my eleventh year and an archery contest was held in the field near the castle, in which all the sons of the samurai, who had reached manhood that year, would take part. They were all splendidly dressed, and each one of them had an attendant carrying a banner with the family crest on it. But Katsuyori was splendidly dressed, more so than the others. Since he had an older brother, his attendant carried not the banners of his father, Lord Shenyan, but those of his mother's family, the Suwa, for he had been declared the heir of that family. As I stood among the wretched urchins as poor as myself, who, who had allowed, been allowed to come and watch their betters, I felt so strongly that I was equally part of the splendor and the splendidly dressed people that I completely forgot my barefoot state and ragged clothing. Suddenly I walked out into the field as if I was one of the participants. A servant of Lord Akiyama, who knew me, grabbed me by the arm and demanded to know where I thought I was going. Getting no reply, he turned me around and gave me a push back to my peers. Looking at them, and then down at myself, it had rained that morning and my feet were really dirty. I burst out crying. Ashamed of my tears, I ran home to the field, uh, then to the kitchen, and then to Togan. It was spring, just after the plum, tree, plum trees had lost their flowers. When I came close to my master's mansion, I saw a little mangy dog. Its pelt was covered with sores, and as I came near it, it put its tail between its leg and crouched. I kicked it angrily. It whined, but did not try to escape. You should bite, I, sa I shouted at the frightened little animal, who was still cringing, waiting for further kicks. I had already raised my foot to supply them when I noticed Togan. He was standing near the lane that led down to the shed, staring at me. My anger turned to shame as I walked toward him. He said nothing, but followed me down the path. I can recall thinking, if only he would hit me as I kicked the dog, but I knew he would not. Finally, as we came near our home, I turned towards him and wailed, I'm like that little dog. Togan only smiled and shook his head. You are not, he said. You're a healthy little puppy. That evening, as Togan played for us on his flute, I thought, he is right. I'm not that mangy little dog I met in the street. The dog Taro was strong and healthy, but not content with being a dog.